Aircraft has been one of the most crucial parts of Navy forces around the world for many, many years. However, maintaining this aircraft can be a challenge for the Navy in this base where snow covers the whole landscape and icy winds breeze 24-7. Crews have to carry out relentless tasks of sustaining and piloting these aircraft in the harshest conditions imaginable. Despite the weather conditions, these aircraft stand frozen as a testament to their unwavering commitment to maintaining airborne operations. In such weather conditions, every takeoff and landing is considered an achievement over the extreme cold. As we dig deeper into the realities of this frozen Air Force base, the first thing to keep in mind is the meticulous effort that's required to keep the runways clear and the aircraft in their best condition. With snow accumulating rapidly, the teams at the base work tirelessly to clean the runways and ensure that they're ready for takeoff and landing. As repetitive as it is, this task is crucial for maintaining a healthy runway during the non-stop snowfall. Along with the runway maintenance, the regular maintenance and inspection of the aircraft are equally demanding in these severe conditions. Maintenance tasks are regularly done by removing snow from the windshields, wings, and fuselage of the aircraft. The step plays a vital role in the safety of the aircraft. Flying with a frostbound aircraft is not just risky, but it also poses a serious danger to both the aircraft crew's safety and functionality. So ensuring that every aircraft is free of snow and ice is essential before flying in these fierce weather conditions. The process of de-icing is also an integral part of the operations of this freezing Air Force base a crucial step to ensure that both the aircraft and runway are safe and in prime condition. De-icing involves the removal of snow, ice, or frost from surfaces. Along with these elements, there's also a process of anti-icing which involves applying certain chemicals that not only remove the existing ice, but also prevent the formation for some time, ensuring clear and functional surfaces. Many methods of de-icing are suitable for various needs. These methods include mechanical means such as pushing, scraping, applying heat and using chemical agents like salt, alcohol, or glycol, each lowering the freezing point of water. Some other methods combine these techniques and are more efficient. This process is vital not only for the runway to remain clear, but also for the aircraft. De-icing the aircraft's body is important to maintain its optimal performance and safety especially in conditions where even the smallest layer of ice can cause significant damage to the aircraft's aerodynamics and complex systems. To ensure the safety of the runway after de-icing, friction testing is held in which specialized vehicles with friction testing kits assess and examine the runway's condition by measuring the level of friction, determining if it's safe for aircraft or not. This step further determines if the runways need further de-icing and also safe runway usability in the extremely cold weather conditions of the base. This friction testing design took over 16 months to invent and was made possible by the NSF and Air Mobility Command working together, highlighting a significant advancement in Arctic aviation technology. In Arctic areas, a variety of unique methods are essential for operations to be carried out all year long. For example, the collaboration between the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Centers, called Region Lab, and the National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs. This partnership led the way to a revolutionary surface design for Antarctica's runways. This runway design involves a compaction technique that strengthens the snow's foundation, thus creating a surface that's capable of supporting heavy aircraft like the C-17. The C-17 is one of the crucial aircraft for this base. It's a large military transport aircraft developed by the United States Air Force from the 1980s to the early 1990s. In the 1970s, the United States Air Force began their research for a replacement for its Lockheed C-130 Hercules tactical cargo aircraft, and Boeing proposed the YC-14 and the YC-15. Though both the planes fully fit the requirements, they were not selected. By 1980, the United States Air Force had a large fleet of aging C-141 Starlifter cargo aircraft. Increased strategic airlift capabilities were needed to fulfill the rapid deployment airlift requirements. So the USAF set mission requirements and released a request for proposals, or an RFP, for CX in October of 1980. 
McDonnell Douglas chose to develop a new aircraft based on the YC-15. Boeing bid an enlarged three-engine version of its AMST YC-14. Lockheed submitted both a C-5 base design and an enlarged C-141 design. On the 28th of August, 1981, McDonnell Douglas was chosen to build its proposal, then designated C-17. Compared to the YC-15, the new aircraft differed in having swept wings, increased size, and more powerful engines. This would allow it to perform the work done by the C-141 and to fulfill some of the duties of the Lockheed C-5, freeing the C-5 fleet for outsized cargo. The first C-17 performed its maiden flight on the 15th of January, 1991, and formally entered the United States Air Force Service on the 17th of January, 1995. The C-17 is based on the YC-165, a smaller prototype airplane used for airlifting during the 1970s. The C-17 typically performs strategic airlift and tactical missions, transporting personnel and cargo all around the world. Other duties of the C-17 include medical evacuation as well as airdrop duties. The C-17 is powered by four Pratt & Whitney F-117 PW100 turbofan engines. Each of these engines produces about 40,400 pounds or 180 kilo newton thrust. The thrust reversers of the engine direct the engine exhaust upward and forward, reducing the chances of any damage caused by foreign objects or ingestion of debris. These thrust reversers are also used in flight at idle reverse for added drag and max speed descents. For cargo operations, the C-17 requires a crew of three people, the pilot, co-pilot, and the loadmaster. The cargo compartment on this aircraft measures about 88 feet long and 18 feet wide with a height of 12 feet 4 inches. The compartment comprises rollers for palletized cargo. However, it can be flipped to be used as a flat floor which is suitable for vehicles and other rolling stock. This cargo can be pretty heavy and putting them in those compartments is a challenge. So, to tackle this situation, the crew utilizes a large aft ramp that accommodates the rolling stock, such as a 69-ton M1 Abrams main battle tank, as well as other armor, trailers, vehicles, and trucks. The Z-17 has a maximum payload of around 77,500 kilograms, a maximum takeoff weight of 265,000 kilograms, with a payload of 73,000 kilograms, and an initial cruise altitude of around 28,000 feet. It can cruise at speeds up to 450 knots or 830 kilometers per hour with a capacity of air dropping 102 paratroopers and their equipment. The C-17 is designed specially to operate from runways as short as 3,500 feet and as narrow as 90 feet. Moreover, it's also suitable to operate from unpaved and unproved runways However, this would put it at risk of getting equipment damage. Even though the C-17 is one of the most versatile aircraft of the Navy, it did come with its fair share of problems. For example, a static test of the C-17 wing in 1992 resulted in its failure. Both of its wings buckled rear to the front and failures were occurring in stringers, spars and ribs of the aircraft. To fix this issue and redesign the structure of the wing, an estimated $100 million was spent. However, during a second test in September of 1993, the wing structure failed again, proving itself as not suitable for the Navy. In April of 1994, the project was still over budget and did not meet the weight, fuel burn, payload, and several other range specifications. This meant that the aircraft had failed several key criteria during its evaluation tests. Furthermore, many problems were also found in the mission's software, landing gear, and other areas of the aircraft. Due to these reasons, the production of the C-17 was cut short to as few as 32 aircraft. However, this decision was later reversed as in July of 1994, according to a report by the Government Accountability Office, it was revealed that the studies by the United States Air Force and Department of Defense from 1986 and 1991 stated that the C-17 could use 6,400 more runways outside of the U.S. than the C-5 aircraft. 
However, these studies made statements considering only the dimensions of the runway and not the runway strength. The C-17 Worldwide Runway Advantage over the C-5 shrank, and from 6,400 airfields dropped down to only 911 airfields. A Government Accountability Office report in 1995 stated that the United States Air Force initially had in mind that they would be ordering 210 C-17s at $41.8 billion. In March 1994, the U.S. Army figured out and decided that it did not need the 27,000 kilogram low altitude parachute extraction system delivery with the C-14, and the 19,000 kilogram capability of the C-130 was enough. A GAO or Government Accountability Office report in 1997 states a problem with the C-17, stating that the aircraft with a full payload could not land on 3,000 feet of wet runway. Simulations suggested that a minimum distance of 5,000 feet was required. However, by September 1995, all the previous problems and issues with the aircraft were reportedly resolved, and the C-17 was fitting into all performance and reliability targets. In 1996, the Department of Defense ordered 80 aircraft, which would then total 120. Boeing offered to cut down the price of the C-17s for the United States Air Force, so in August of 2002, the order was increased to 180 aircraft. In 2010, Boeing reduced the production rate of the C-17s from 16 per year to 10 per year because of the decreasing orders and also to extend the production line's life while more orders were being taken. In these Arctic and Antarctic areas, the commitment and dedication to year-round operations are not just organized challenges but also a testament to human intelligence and resilience. The missions in these extreme regions come with a wide array of activities, including plane landings on snow-covered runways, prompt deployment of various missions, efficient unloading of essential supplies, and many more. A vital player in these operations is the LC-130, a ski-equipped version of the Lockheed Martin C-130 Hercules, specially designed for carrying out operations in polar regions. The Lockheed C-130 Hercules is an American four-engine turboprop military transport aircraft that's designed by Lockheed Martin. It's capable of using unprepared runways for takeoffs and landings. Originally, the C-130 was designed to serve as a troop medical evacuation and cargo transport aircraft. However, its versatile airframe has also been beneficial to use in other roles, like as a gunship for air-to-air -air warfare search and rescue missions, weather reconnaissance, aerial refueling, aerial firefighting, and maritime patrol. The aircraft today is the main tactical airlift for military forces all around the world. The LC-130 started as a prototype model that was developed by modifying the C-130A with skis in 1958. After it was tested in 1957, 12 additional C-130A models were modified with hydraulics and skis. In 1959, the first four factory-equipped ski base Hercules were produced. The primary task of the LC-130 is to support the scientific community in Antarctica by transporting supplies, cargo, and personnel from field stations and camps. The aircraft come equipped with retractable skis that enable the aircraft to safely land on snow and ice as well as on traditional runways. The aircraft has provision for using rocket-assisted takeoff, also known as RADO rockets. Each side has four of these bad boys. RADO rockets are installed and used when the LC-130 aircraft is carrying out missions from rough, slippery snow surfaces and when shorter takeoff runs are needed. Operated by the 109th Airlift Wing of the New York National Guard, these aircraft are uniquely adapted to the harsh conditions of the Arctic and Antarctic. They have the ability to land on snow and ice, and even their durable construction makes them suitable for transporting personnel, equipment, and supplies in various inhospitable and remote environments. Every successful landing and deployment highlights the importance and operational capabilities of these versatile aircraft. These aircraft can be deemed as the heart of carrying out missions in this Air Force base. As the LC-130 Hercules gradually descends onto the icy runway, one of its primary missions comes into focus, deploying snowmobile units. 
These vehicles are specially made for mobility in snowy terrain and are smoothly deployed from the aircraft in environments where conventional road vehicles with winter tires fall short. Snowmobiles can be referred to as the perfect vehicles to affect ground operations because of their agility and robust design, which enables their movement to be swift across the snowy terrain being helpful for a variety of tasks, ranging from emergency responses to transportation of goods, personnel, and supplies. They're designed to be operated on snow and ice and don't require a road or trail. Older snowmobiles could typically accommodate two people at once. However, most of the snowmobiles that have been manufactured after 1990 have been designed to accommodate only one person. Most of these snowmobiles have no coverage except for a windshield with their engines normally driving a continuous track at the rear. Most of the earlier snowmobiles used ordinary rubber tracks, whereas modern snowmobiles utilize tracks that are made of Kevlar composite construction. Being this versatile, operating these snowmobiles is not an easy task. Extensive and rigorous training exercises are conducted to ensure that the personnel are ready to operate these vehicles under extreme weather conditions. These exercises help in enhancing the readiness, handling ability, and proficiency of the personnel in executing any mission. Deploying these snowmobiles from the LC-130 is more than just a logistical mission. Instead, it symbolizes the adaptability and readiness that defines missions in these unbearable weather conditions. Along with the snowmobiles, the U.S. Navy also utilizes the Panzer to carry out Arctic operations in the snow. These tough military vehicles play one of the most crucial roles in transportation missions, navigating rugged terrain with ease. The United States Army Engineer Research and Development Center, specifically the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory Mobility Group, leads the advancement of these versatile vehicles. These vehicles have the responsibility to conduct a series of maneuvers in both wheeled and tracked vehicles, demonstrating excellent agility under extreme weather conditions. These exercises, ranging from ascending snow-covered hills to navigating snow-covered terrain, are not only an assessment of the vehicle capabilities, but are also a very crucial part of developing mobility solutions. The performance of the vehicle is then examined and insights are gained, which then help in addressing the challenges the vehicle faced on the difficult terrain. Modern snowmobiles have either a four or two stroke internal combustion engine. However, most of these snowmobiles are preferably manufactured with two stroke engines due to their reduced cost, complexity, and weight. Snowmobiles in earlier times can only produce five horsepower. However, with engine technology and sizes evolving, in the early 1990s, snowmobiles were made using the biggest engines available, ranging from 600cc to 800cc. These engines produce approximately 115 horsepower. Currently, there are several variants of snowmobiles available with 1200cc or bigger engines, producing over 150 horsepower. Some of these models are also turbocharged, which drastically increases the performance and horsepower of the snowmobile. However, the snowmobile's inherent maneuverability, acceleration, and high-speed abilities require the personnel operating it to undergo extensive physical strength training. This is due to snowmobile injuries and accidents being high. Losing control of the snowmobile could cause significant damage, injury, or even death. One of the causes of such accidents could be the loss of control from a loose grip. These accidents may include swerving off of a path in which the snowmobile can roll over or crash into another obstacle. In unknown areas, riders might also crash into barbed wire or haywire fences at high speeds. To reduce these risks, the snowmobile operators go through proper training, wear appropriate gear, and are aware of their surroundings. For safety reasons, most snowmobiles come equipped with a cord that's connected to a kill switch, which would stop the snowmobile if the rider loses control of it. Aside from the specially designed snow vehicles, another significant part of transportation is the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, known as the JLTV. This program was a partnered effort of the United States Army, the United States Marine Corps, and Special Operations Command that was started to partially replace the Humvee fleet with a family of more versatile and survivable vehicles that can offer greater payload. Initiated with early studies in 2006, the JLTV program develops lessons learned from the future Tactical Truck Systems Program and other associated projects. 
The high operability and mobility multi-purpose vehicle, Humvee, was first revealed in 1985. It was designed during the Cold War, a period where threats like IEDs or improvised explosive devices and asymmetric warfare were not the main target for the military. However, it became evident that the Humvees were vulnerable to IEDs and the challenges and expense in effectively increasing the armor of these vehicles led to the development of the JLTV. While initially being considered as a direct replacement for the Humvee, the U.S. Department of Defense officials now clarify that the JLTVs were originally intended to work alongside the Humvee rather than entirely replacing the Humvee fleet. The Humvee fleet was first seen in combat in Operation Just Cause. The United States Invasion of Panama in 1989. The Humvee was designed to carry personnel and light cargo transport behind the front lines. The basic Humvee vehicle comes with no armor or protection against any chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear threats. However, losses were significantly low in conventional operations, such as the Gulf War. However, the crew and vehicles did suffer significant damage in the Battle of Mogadishu in 1993 because of the nature of the urban advancements. Nevertheless, the chassis survivability allowed the majority of the crew to return safely to cover. Although the Humvee was never designed to offer protection, it still seeks to offer an enhanced capability of survivability, payload, and mobility addressing the evolving needs of modern warfare. The Humvees also underwent numerous modifications and upgrades. In December of 2004, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld faced criticism from the United States troops and their families for not providing the soldiers with better equipped Humvees. This caused Rumsfeld to point out the fact that before the war, armor kits were produced in very small quantities per year. As the primary focus of the American Army changed in their war against Iraq from fighting the Iraqi army to suppressing them, more armor kits started to be manufactured. Unlike typical similar-sized civilian cargo and tow trucks, which have dual rear wheels to reduce sway, the Humvee vehicles come with only a single rear wheel as it has an independent rear suspension coupled with a body design. Most of these up-armored Humvees are capable of withstanding lateral attacks when the blast impact is scattered in all different directions. However, it still offers little to no protection against mine blasts. The Humvee has the capability of accommodating four people with an available fully enclosed aluminum cabin with a vertical windshield. It has an all-wheel drive with an independent suspension and helical gear reduction hubs similar to portal axles, which attach towards the top rather than the center of each wheel to allow the drivetrain shafts to be raised for 16-inch ground clearance. The body's mounted on a narrow steel frame with boxed rails and five cross members for rigidity. The rails act as sliders to protect the drivetrain, which is nestled between and above the rails. Raising the drivetrain into the cabin area and lowering the seats into the frame creates a chest-high transmission hump separating passengers on each side and lowering the overall center of gravity compared to most trucks, where the body and passengers are above the frame. The vehicle comes equipped with a double wishbone suspension with portal gear hubs on all four wheels and inboard disc brakes. The brake discs are not mounted at the wheels like the ordinary traditional cars, but are inboard of the half shafts, attached outboard of the differentials. The front and rear differentials are torsion type, and the center differential is of the lockable type. Torque biasing differentials allow forward movement as long as at least one wheel has traction. It runs on specialized tires with low-profile run-flat devices. Newer Humvee versions can be equipped with a central tire inflation system, also known as the CTIS kit in the field. While it's optimized for off-road mobility, it can achieve 55 miles per hour at maximum weight with a top speed of 70 miles per hour unladen. The first delivery order for the JLTV was announced on the 23rd of March in 2016, in which the U.S. Army funded an order of 657 JLTVs along with their kits and support. The order was estimated to be around $243 million and included vehicles for the Marines and Army. According to Oshkosh, the company responsible for the production of the JLTVs, the vehicles, trailers, and installed kits for this order will be delivered by the first quarter of the fiscal year in 2018. 
the vehicle can operate in all altitudes from minus 500 feet to 12,000 feet and maintain full mission capability at temperatures ranging from negative 40 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. When the temperatures drop even below zero, the JLTV can start in no longer than one minute with no external aids, kits, or prior warming of the batteries. The vehicle is capable of traveling 350 miles at 35 miles per hour or 300 miles in operations terrain on a single tank of fuel. It can accelerate from 0 to 30 miles per hour in 9.7 seconds on dry, hard terrain. Other tactically driven mobility capabilities of the JLTV include a threshold 27 foot turning radius and the ability to climb 24 inch vertical obstacles in both forward and reverse. These vehicles are transportable by sea, rail, and air, and on all classes of ocean going ships, and they don't even require much of their parts to be disassembled in the process of being transported. These vehicles have been used by military forces all around the world, including Belgium. Brazil, Lithuania, and Romania, and are expected to be delivered to other forces like the United Kingdom, Portugal, and Poland. As we conclude our exploration of these challenging and extraordinary Arctic and Antarctic operations, it's important to give credit to the hardworking soldiers who work in these harsh weather conditions, and also the excellent engineering and adaptability of these vehicles that make these difficult missions possible, like the Snow Panzers, snowmobiles, the cutting-edge technology and capability offered by the LC-130 and the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle. Each of these vehicles has a different role and plays a significant part in ensuring the success of their missions by overcoming the challenges posed by the harsh environment. The collaborative efforts put in by various military branches and organizations highlight a commitment to innovation and safety, guaranteeing that operations can be carried out effectively regardless of the weather conditions. And that brings us to the end of the video. We hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to give this video a like, and make sure you subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification so that you never miss another video from us. Thanks very much for watching everybody, we'll catch you in the next one.